our next panel, um, which will feature a series of papers by scholars studying military uses of artificial intelligence. The panel is entitled, What Problems Does AI Present from the Standpoint of Virtue Ethics? Um, our first speaker will be Colonel James Cook. He is permanent professor in and head of the Department of Philosophy at the US Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A cyber and foreign area officer, he has served in Europe, Afghanistan, and at the Pentagon. He earned his PhD in philosophy from the Universität Heidelberg, Germany, and he publishes broadly on a number of philosophical topics, including the ethics of war. He is co-editor of the Journal of Military Ethics, and his paper is entitled The Ethics of Blood and E-Brain. I'm just going to go through and introduce everyone before we get started, so it'll be a smooth transition between speakers. Um, our second speaker will be Jonathan Escanas, who is an assistant professor of politics here at the Catholic University of America. He works on the connections between the Republican tradition, technology, and national security. He has a BS in international politics from Georgetown University and an MPhil and DPhil in international relations from Oxford. He has worked at the Council on Foreign Relations, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, and the Clement Center for National Security at the University of Texas. He's currently working on two books, A Muse of Fire, Why the U.S. Military Forgets What It Learns in War, on what happens to wartime innovations when the war is over, and The Shot in the Dark, A History of the U.S. Army Asymmetric Warfare Group, the first comprehensive over overview of a unit that helped the Army adapt to the post-9-11 era of counterinsurgency and global power competition. Our last speaker will be Anna Foyer, who is the Julian Stewart Chair of Social Sciences at Deep Springs College. She received a PhD in political science from Yale University, and her research focuses on counterinsurgency, military technology, and cultural and environmental history. Her book project, The Frictionless Battlefield, Nature and Technology in Counterinsurgency Wars, traces the historical development of geospatial technologies used to make battlefields legible in the 20th and 21st century counterinsurgency campaigns. Uh, before beginning her academic career, Foyer worked on national security policy and conflict prevention at the Council on Foreign Relations. And as a Marshall Scholar, she completed a master's degree in global and imperial history from Oxford and international studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Her paper is entitled, Everybody Has to Be Somewhere, the logic of geospatial intelligence. And Micah Verbruggen will respond to the papers and moderate the ensuing discussion. She is a doctoral researcher at the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy in the Brussels School of Governance at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels. Sorry for the pronunciation. Originally a historian and a sociologist, she now studies the future of warfare. Her specialty is the interplay between emerging technologies, military innovation, and arms control. She's currently finishing up her PhD on military innovation and artificial intelligence, and particularly the controversies behind its long histories. Uh, and I'm very excited about this group. I mean, as you can tell from their biographies, a lot of uh, great uh, work has been done, a lot of great experience in these areas. And again, I encourage everyone in the audience to submit questions using the Q&A functions of Zoom. Um, the end of the session will be dedicated to audience questions along with the exchanges among the panelists. So with that, let's start with Colonel Cook's paper. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much. And thanks to John Asconis and to uh, Provost Dominguez. Thank you, sir. And to the good folks at Lidos, uh, Ron Kiesing uh, is uh, very gracious to uh, contribute to this effort. And it's a wonderful honor to be here. Thank you very much to all. I'd also like to offer a quick disclaimer because I'm still active duty, these opinions are mine only and they don't reflect any position of the US Air Force, the US Department of Defense. So if I understood the charter, I'm gonna spend about 15 minutes under the, the guise of this uh, panel, this wonderful rubric that allows us to point out some problems, but I suspect also some opportunities with artificial intelligence. And I'd like to start uh, with a tiny biographical note, and that is, as you might have noticed uh, by looking at me, I found another gray hair this morning, which means I'm actually old, and I've been in the Air Force for a long time. As a matter of fact, I signed up in 1984. And when I think of 84, um, it has some relevance because that was the year that uh, Gibson published Neuromancer. 
um, along with the short story, Burning Chrome, uh, the place where we get the term cyberspace. We also had a movie called The Terminator, which has already been mentioned before, um, maybe not directly, but in terms of Skynet this morning. And of course, in the following year, when I was commissioning, uh, we also had a book by Orson Scott Card, Ender's Game, in which a young man uh, uses some pretty potent uh, computer technology, one might, uh, might say AI, and ends up being had if one reads the follow-up novels, as perhaps many of us have. So by luck, and it was considered uh, bad luck at the time by me and by the people who were advising me, um, I was told that my math background uh, trumped my philosophy background and I did my first assignment in the basement of the Pentagon, the very bowels. And normally I wouldn't bother you with this bit of trivia, um, except to say that I actually had the opportunity to see a kind of before and after, a group of people who were experts who had very little trust and very little use for computer technology, uh, paired with a group of up and comers in the basements of the Pentagon, and there are more than one. And uh, together they created a kind of contrast. Uh, the group uh, of old schoolers, as I'll call them, um, perhaps led by a gentleman who had flown in the Battle of Britain and had a nice Air Force career, was able to do a lot of logistics, um, was able to look at what we called the worldwide military command and control system almost intuitively. He didn't have much difficulty at all guessing what needed to go where and what its replenishment rate would be. There were others who were brand new and who were very, very excited about uh, a major computer system. And I was in the basement because I was working on that. Um, th the contrast was start for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, we know from uh, recent coverage of Ukraine that as Omar Bradley is sometimes quoted as saying, the amateur thinks about strategy, the professional about logistics. And to a large extent, this was a logistics issue. It was about replenishment that would allow the United States and its allies to win wars of various kinds. Um, However, it became clear very quickly that a tool is never just an instrument, that we are always tools of our tools. As the old school members of this basement community would quickly point out that whenever the computer system made a mistake, we followed blindly as though years later we would follow our GPS right off a cliff as has happened. That we would, for example, be so captivated by our technology that we would fail to use common sense of the kind that our famous uh, Russian Lieutenant Colonel used to avert what could have been a major nuclear exchange as mentioned earlier. Well, after a while, however, even the old guard realized that the amount of data that we were seeing was so extreme that it looked like we would need more than just a bevy of experienced people, that in fact, what we needed was a factotum that had never existed in human form. We needed what we would later call um, in the military, it was already being called that in industry and in academe, an expert system. And you've already heard Paul Charest talk about expert systems and their differences with some other kinds of AI, especially the kind of AI that can engage in machine learning. At that point, there was a nascent sense that the machine actually was learning, not in the same sense as we talk about today. Perhaps I'll have the time to come back. What what I want to focus on for a moment is the question about us becoming the tools of our tools, whether or not the old guard was right, that there was something perverting about over-reliance on the machine, not just in the sense that we might make a mistake, but that we were allowing our skills and our judgment to rust. There was discussion um, in part because there were other people who had not just a math background or a computer science background, but some interest in philosophy that perhaps the machine itself could someday become independent. It was uh, very shortly after in 1987 that Star Trek The Next Generation appeared and suddenly we had the figure of data after a while. And of course, the um, screenplay writers who allowed data to figure in their thinking and in their musings about ethics as well as other issues, 
believed that perhaps we could talk about not just the ethics, the virtue ethics, the excellence of the tool user, but perhaps even of the tool. Now, as I became more immersed in the military, especially in military education and training and more experienced in the field in various places around the world, I realized as well that much of the military's attempt to train, especially the very young, but also older officers at uh, professional military education institutions, as we call them, such as Air Command and Staff College or Air War College, Naval War College, et cetera, that they tended to use a virtue ethical model. And there was a reason for that, of course, and that is that the, the military has long looked at the battle spaces we inhabit and that we fight in as being particularly chaotic and unpredictable. So if the choice is between providing younger generations a shinier, high fidelity crystal ball than they already have, um, we probably are going to despair once we get that new crystal ball out in the field and we try to give people a list of rules in their schooling that they can use to reason through difficult moral problems in the chaotic battle space using consequentialist, perhaps utilitarian means. Similarly, when we try a deontic approach and we try to give rules that are valuable, for example, the principle of distinction or non-combatant immunity, we nonetheless find that these founder sometimes on the chaos that I've already mentioned, that the rules are difficult to apply. What should they be? Should we have, for example, a wallet card, perhaps a whole deck of wallet cards that are nicely laminated for battlefield conditions that for, perhaps, can uh, serve to uh, give us some hypothetical imperatives or something like that in addition to a categorical imperative. Again, unlikely that that's going to suffice. So we have tended in the military to rely on virtue ethics. And this, as I got deeper into computer science and into my career field, which is now called cyber, it was not at the time, became the obvious MO. And it had another advantage as well, and that is as we struggled to define what machines were and what they were doing for us, most of us believe that AI itself, and not just the black box aspects, the opaque aspects, as we heard in the last panel, uh, of machine learning, it's not just that kind of vagueness that we were trying to get our heads around. If we thought of AI as being in some sense intelligent, we had to admit that we didn't know how to define human intelligence either, but that we could say certain things about the excellences, the virtues of that realm. Think of the first sentence of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics that divides ethics or um, virtues rather into virtues of intellect and virtues of character. So as we thought about what was happening, we thought, well, at least we want uh, a system that is good at what it does. Maybe Plato's pruning knife in Republic One, it has a certain excellence because it has a certain function. But we also wanted that factotum type machine that was versatile enough to act a bit more like a human being, able to accommodate vagaries of various kinds that had to be accommodated because we were finding the level of complication of various problems in battle spaces, but also in between wars, were becoming more than human beings, even groups of be human beings could handle in a way that would keep up with our adversaries. So we found that a virtue ethics approach was a very potent one, at least the most promising for dealing with the education and training of our young, so to say, but also the way that we conceived expert systems and systems that went beyond that, went beyond just codifications of rules and started to break new ground. Because I wanted to attend to the theme of this particular panel, I think I should touch on what might be some of the difficulties uh, that face us when we try to 
use AI in a virtue ethical mode. And in particular, when we try to do the public relations work that militaries always have to do. After Vietnam, after Watergate, after the church commission, and I could list an awful lot of things, some thinkers, some sociologists, social psychologists have pointed out that we have a decreasing trust in authority. It's not surprising that the roots of our virtue ethics come from thinkers such as Plato and Aristotle who tended to be elitist. And if we don't wanna use that E word, we might think of what might be imaginary to some extent, halcyon generations of American thinkers, but also an American public that trusted authority more than we do now. From my point of view, if one is going to explain the use of AI to the public in a military context, one has to assume that like in virtue ethics, we value the good person. We value, for example, the person who has shown a kind of ethical character that we describe in terms of virtue ethics, for example, in terms of the cardinal virtues. Now, it's gonna be a stretch anyway to talk to people about an AI system being programmed in a way that allows it to demonstrate the same virtue. But when things go wrong, as they inevitably will, even with the best uh, systems of AI, for example, um, AI that has engaged in machine learning, it's fairly clear, I think, that we will have difficulty convincing the American public that some other approach was not better. I believe there will always be critics, even within the military, who will say that we should have taken a more algorithmic approach that is consistent with either a consequentialist or deontic model rather than a virtue model. I'm already hearing that. I won't go into some of the details. I will, however, return to those early days of my career in closing and point out that I still occasionally meet some of the now rather elderly folks who represented a kind of pre computer generation who came from World War II. They were very well aware of Grace Hopper and some of the other luminaries who used automation to help in that effort, but they still prize human judgment. They're still convinced that the ethics that they possessed, the virtues, the excellence that they possessed can't be duplicated by machines. There are, however, traitors in that gray bearded uh, cadre. And some of them have even moved in and are still working as advisors in the tech sector. And I'm very happy to think that they who thought of themselves and thought of their own ethics in virtue terms are injecting that into their present work. So anyway, thank you so much again for having me. I'm really delighted. I don't wanna go over time and by my lights, I'm getting close. So thank you again. Uh, thank well, you so much. Over to you, Jonathan. All right. Thank you so much, Meka. And, and uh, thanks again to, to Paul, to Ron Kessing, uh, to all the folks at Lighthouse for making this possible. It's really a kind of, I feel like we have a dream team of, of practitioners, of academics, of, of civilians and military talking about these issues today. And I'm really uh, honored and delighted to be here. Um, and it's hard to follow up on, on, uh, on Colonel Cook's uh, voice of experience, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do my best. In, uh, in 2004, uh, and the aftermath of the American invasion of Iraq uh, and the, uh, the beginning of the use of IEDs to uh, kill American soldiers in Iraq, uh, the Army created the IED task force to get a sense of why were so many soldiers dying uh, to these devices. And uh, conversations with uh, General, Lieutenant Gen well, Lieutenant Gen General uh, Decody, who is really the impetus behind this effort, it came out of the conviction that American soldiers shouldn't be dying in such numbers to, to such a simple device. And so something had clearly gone wrong. Uh, and one of the things that the task force did was it deployed field teams. These field teams were experienced Army Special Operations uh, soldiers who had recently retired, uh, who would embed with Army units uh, in the line of fire in Iraq and get a sense of what was going on. 
And there were technical and technological challenges uh, that uh, made these devices so deadly. But what the field teams told me is that the thing they were most surprised by was the lack of sound military judgment about how to respond to IEDs, respond to ambushes, and uh, to plan military operations uh, in the light of this new threat. In other words, that many of these losses to IEDs, at least in these early days, 2004, 2005, uh, were not necessarily due to the sophistication or the complexity of the IED threat. IEDs as mines have been a part of, war, of all modern warfare, but the fact that um, the army hadn't trained soldiers how to adapt to a new challenge like this, that they were stuck in procedures and practices uh, that they had been taught and that they had been so, they had internalized those to such a high extent that they weren't exercising their own practical judgment about uh, changing their patterns of behavior, changing timing, changing route planning, even changing it in ways that at first blush contravene doctrine in order to mitigate the IED threat. The IED task force evolved into an organization called the Asymmetric Warfare Group. And in 2010, they deployed to Afghanistan uh, with the first uh, Switchblade 300 uh, systems. Uh, we, we, you might have seen these in the news. Uh, we're likely going to be sending them to yeah, Ukraine in large numbers. It was the first tactical loitering munition, loitering munition in Army history. It was a UAV with a kind of kamikaze warhead, and you could uh, control it from the air for a certain amount of time, and then you could use it to target. And what they found was that the technology, the, 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 uh, when they put this into soldiers' hands and they worked with them to use it on the battlefield, the challenges they faced we're not about the technology. The technology was relatively intuitive. The battlefield effect was relatively intuitive. But the challenge was actually pushing down the training and the authorities uh, to allow it to be effective at the tactical level. That the issues soldiers were having were not about using it uh, and achieving the, the desired battlefield effects, but about um, their comfort in doing so given a the cultural and military process constraints around the use of this technology. So why do I give these two anecdotes? I think what the, the what virtue ethics tells us or, or directs us to pay our attention to about thinking about the use of AI is not just the limits or constraints of AI as a technical system, but that AI's use in the military will only matter in the context of the humans that are using it, in the context of, in the overall context of Milita the military's process and practices and culture, right? So we need to assess the performance, including the ethical performance AI, not on its own, but in the context of concrete human AI teams and actual military processes. And moreover, as Paul's earlier anecdote about the Gulf War friendly fire incidents showed, what you might call the long-term equilibrium performance of the system is not just what you get when you field the system with a test platoon, at a proven gap grounds, or even when it's first deployed in the battlefield, but rather what occurs as new human intuitions, trust or mistrust, shortcuts, and judgments are formed about the system and about the world through the lens of the system. In other words, what the, the long-term effect of implementing uh, a new AI system is how does it change the military and its practices and, and in what it inculcates in soldiers or service members for better or for worse. Now, this fundamental insight from the study of technology, that new technologies cannot help but reshape the environment that humans work in, is powerful, but unspecific. It's very, you know, this is kind of the problem with, with technological critique is it's very generic in some ways. So what should this tell us about AI and military AI in particular? What principles for the development of AI can we derive from this fundamental idea that the effect, again, that the effect is not what can the technology do, but what is the effect on the over on the military as an overall institution once it is implemented, including in its in its training of and the preservation of practices and virtues in actual service members? So I think the most important idea is something that Paul sort of hinted on, which is that to some extent the ethical challenges posed by AI there are some unique ones, but actually they're they're a flavor of the generic ethical challenges posed by many new kinds of technology, and I really appreciated Paul's use of. Um, the uh, complexities of uh, air power and the ways that that inculcated new kinds of practice, ethical practices for the military. I liked uh, Colonel Cook's example of, of uh, the AI in the basement, right? Um, these are new challenges, but they're not that new. So ethical action can be no more hardwired into an AI than it can into a rifle or a howitzer. 
Rather, virtuous action emerges from the institutional structures that shape human AI teams, especially shaping culture, process, training, and the development of professional judgment. And I actually think indirect fire by artillery is a useful example, right? So artillery, they're, they're classically, uh, we have fancy new uh, laser guided shells, but in principle, it's a, it was used as a dumb weapon, right? Once that shell left the trajectory, it, it went on its posted trajectory to wherever it had been set. So by actually using artillery ethically, uh, at least as an indirect fire weapon, so where you're not directly looking at the thing you're firing on, you're not directly observing the battlefield effect. Using it ethically requires a culture of precision, processes for verification and communication between direct observers and the artillery unit, and standards for certainty, uh, and skill and virtue in courage to accept risk, exercise right judgment about whether one is ready to fire. So the so the, the use of, a, of artillery requires virtue, uh, and we can distinguish between right and wrong action in part through by the extent to which right judgment is inculcated and in both the practices that train uh, you know, artillery officers and art, art, artillery, artillery men and women, uh, but also how those are overseen culturally, ethically, uh, in terms of military process, et cetera. As it regards the development of virtue in AI, uh, one unique feature of certain kinds of machine learning is that they separate mathematically demonstrable truth or, or, or and predictably, uh, demonstra predictably testable truth about the world from the human ability to narrativize cause and effect. So virtue ethics would suggest that this represents a challenge to the human model of judgment, wherein what renders an action intelligible and right or wrong is how it fits into the stories we can tell, connecting concrete circumstances with human goals, purposes, roles, and norms of right and wrong behavior. So in order to tell whether an action is right or wrong, we fit it into a story that includes assessments of what someone is trying to do, whether they, they are, whether the thing that they're trying to do is right or wrong, whether the action is likely or unlikely to achieve that, and, and many other such factors. So this, this unique feature of military, of, of machine intelligence, uh, produces a danger of a kind of learned helplessness <coughs> where the thing that makes it effective, uh, where, where the technology operates by an action that is opaque to most of its users. And I think GPS is a good uh, is a good analog here, right? It can lead to an atrophy of judgment because it's difficult to discern. We, we trust it because it's shown itself to be effective, but it's difficult to, to discern, uh, for the average user to discern the action by which it actually is effective and therefore whether in a particular case it is, it is correct or incorrect. <laughs> And this atrophy of military judgment can result by developing a habit or even a culture or a norm or even legal processes of deferring to the military, the, the machine's judgment. So do service members lose the ability or the need to routinely exercise judgment over a ladder of easy cases, in other words, you're practicing your land navigation, and thereby the skill to assess those hard cases or to assess the performance of the AI itself? And there's also a process to mention in the military for this. When are you allowed to exercise your own judgment? Right? Anyone who's, who's overseen uh, you know, 18 or 19 year old service members will recognize the fact that you do not always want to allow them to exercise their own judgment. Um, and yet you need to allow them to develop judgment in order to be able to exercise it in the future. So these I think are some of the real tensions that the, the, the um, adoption of AI exposes. I also think it's important to recognize an opportunity that virtue ethics points to. Uh, there's a new study, um, a brand new study of the top performers in Go, uh, this game which uh, was famously, I wouldn't say it's solved, but uh, the AlphaGo, Google DeepMind's AlphaGo system famously developed to be able to beat a top level player using um, stunning moves that no human had ever used before. What this study showed is that the aggregate level of world class Go players has actually significantly increased since the development of AlphaGo. Uh, in other words, that expert, uh, human experts using, being inspired by, learning from uh, unique insights of AI systems are actually even better as a result. And we, this, this, this study is also replicable to poker, replicable to chess, and other sort of high-level, high high-judgment uh, fields of human activity. So all the evidence suggests that so-called centaurs or human AI teams, or might say human expert AI teams, have an absolute performance 
that exceeds either humans alone or AIs alone. So if we get this balance right, if we can preserve meaningful human judgment and develop human expertise along working with or alongside AI systems, we get an, a, a better result as a whole. So because machine learning can uh, derive insights from the world and develop novel strategies and predictive data in an emergent manner that defies human intuition, an unreflected deference to it has the potential to undermine the development of human judgment from the lowest to the highest level in what is really an unprecedented way. I think this is at least one of the really unique challenges of AI. So when we view the ethical problem of AI in this holistic manner of what it does to the military as a virtue forming institution, and not just through the lens of Skynet or killer robots, we pay attention to the problems that AI pre presents beyond the use of lethal weapons. So examples might include the use of massive data in tactical military intelligence to discern and predict terrorist networks, the use of automated generation to develop and run simulation environments, which is where soldiers and, and service members will be training in, which the army uh, alone is gonna spend tens of billions of dollars developing over the next decade. Or, <coughs> pardon me, the atrophying of firsthand skills to understand complex maintenance problems, to have a feel for a complex system like a ship, due in part to the catastrophic success of AI uh, at other predictive maintenance tasks. So using big data and machine learning, these systems will increasingly dictate how service members come to understand and act in the world. So we need to advance our understanding of how uh, AI mediated information systems affect ethical military judgment and what cognitive skills and dispositions are needed to preserve it. And our goal must be to preserve meaningful human judgment. By this, I mean, that we integrate AI into military processes, including training, doctrine, and culture in such a way that human skill in both using the system and exercising judgment about the system and about the world is preserved. I think we can envision three critical scenarios uh, in which we need to think about this problem. The first is that we need to maintain meaningful human judgment on the loop at speed and scale. In other words, it's not merely not to have humans on the loop. If we don't give the humans the context and the skill and the training and the trust and the process to actually exercise their judgment in a way. And I think the, the example of the Patriot battery in the Gulf War is a great example. Yes, you have humans on the loop, but if you've created a context in which they face significant institutional incentives in one direction and not the other, and you're not giving them appropriate context and training to trust in, this, in their actual skill as practitioners to overrule the system, then actually all you've done is create a cutout for responsibility. You've just created a cutout of responsibility for someone up higher in the chain of command. You actually haven't developed military judgment and you, we had a bad result as an example. Paradoxically, I think um, drones and remotely piloted aircraft are actually a positive example of this, where the distance uh, and the lack of danger created by, by this technology enable pilots to exercise more careful judgment about uh, certain uses of, of, of weapons tactically than when you have F-18 pilots flying over the battlefield at 500 miles per hour and also operating these kinds of systems. Second, we have to train, we have to preserve military judgment in order to maintain resilience against systems failure, right? So the reason why, you know, the Navy has gone back to training with azimuths and, uh, you know, the Marines are re-emphasizing land navigation is that if the system fails, you, you will achieve operational failure if you had not maintained your ability to function without the system. And I think we also especially need to pay attention to the extent to which that which is left out of the AI model returns in the form of crisis. And I think the, the USS Fitz, Fitzgerald's collision uh, is, a, is a really damning instance of this if you read the report, which I highly encourage you to. One of the reasons why there was this collision was that, that sailors were overly deferring to automated detection systems, which had reached, which had in this case had a kind of unique failure mode, possibly a conjecture with hostile with some hostile interference. And they, they had neglected fundamental sailing practices designed to prevent collisions. And the third, maybe the most important, is you need to preserve military judgment in order to be able to detect systems malfunction or malicious interference. And I think when we think about the mil, uh, military activities occurring in a competitive domain, this is one area where um, machine learning faces a, a distinct military challenge, which is you will have malicious actors who are intentionally operating in ways to defeat and uh, manipulate the, the machine's judgment, right? Through data poisoning, 
through the use of, of countermeasures or defeat techniques. Uh, and so the only way to use these systems co confidently in a military context is if you are investing in maintaining military judgment to both figure out when the system is malfunctioning, the sort of Stanislaw Petra problem, and also to detect covert and malicious interference in the systems of operations. So uh, with that, I'll leave it off. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm looking forward to questions and comments and conversation. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm next. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for having me. Thank you to Catholic University and to Lighthouse. And um, I'm very excited to be on this panel and to get to know my fellow panelists. And I'm also really looking forward to questions and discussions after the papers. Um, so I want to start actually with Michael Walter's classic account in Just and Unjust Wars. Um, and I want to start with his famous dilemma of the naked soldier. Um, and this is a very famous chapter of the book. Many of you probably are familiar with it. Um, Paul Charest also addresses the same dilemma in his book, though he does so from a consequentialist perspective. But I think it's kind of a useful uh, scenario to, to keep in mind when we're thinking about the relationship between AI and virtue ethics. So uh, Michael Walzer, drawing from several war memoirs, including Goodbye to All That by Robert Graves, des describes scenarios in which snipers who spot enemy soldiers engaged in the most mundane and unwarlike of activities. So for example, a naked soldier taking a bath in a river behind enemy lines, another in the process of pulling on his pants, another smoking a cigarette, another sunbathing in the newfound warmth of spring. And in each case, the sniper declines to shoot the enemy soldier. I disliked the idea of shooting a naked man, Graves writes in his memoir, even though Graves understood it at his, as his military duty to do so. The sniper's refusal to shoot the enemy soldiers, writes Michael Walzer, quote, seems to go to the heart of the war convention. For what does it mean to say that someone has a right to life? To say that is to recognize a fellow creature who is not threatening me, whose activities have the savor of peace and camaraderie, whose person is as valuable as my own, end quote. So the decision to spare the life of the naked man runs contrary to Robert Graves' military duty. The naked soldier does not lose his status as part of a class of legitimate targets simply by virtue of being naked and thus being non-threatening at that particular moment. But as Larry May has argued, there is nothing honorable about killing a naked soldier who is taking a bath. So May writes, quote, retaining a sense of honor, especially while on the battlefield, is a crucial part of the moral landscape for soldiers. For without a heightened sense of honor, the soldier is merely a paid killer, end quote. So it may be legal to kill the naked soldier, but it may not be honorable to kill the naked soldier. And I think it's essential to distinguish between legality and honor here if we're to understand the legitimacy of killing in war as a, a live and ever-present ethical question, rather than a matter that is simply already settled by the law. So Walter's point is that the sniper is a moral agent in war, capable of deciding when it is ethically appropriate or inappropriate to kill regardless of the rules of combat. Because and only because he operates within a particular and immediate context. The sniper's expression of ethical agency is only ever context specific for someone like Walter. It entails a process of deliberation in which the sniper considers the relevance of an ethical principle, so let's say the rule governing non-combatant immunity, to a particular event or a particular question. By contrast, the undeliberate or mechanical application of, a, of an ethical principle, even if that principle is a true ethical principle, or even if it's correct, is not a real example of ethical action on the part of the soldier himself. It doesn't involve genuine ethical deliberation. So in other words, the sniper can only act honorably or dishonorably in light of his assessment of the facts of the case. Some of the facts he must consider include whether the target is a member of a class that may be legitimately targeted, whether he's a member of an exception class, for example, a soldier that has been wounded, and whether he poses a threat to the sniper or to the sniper's fellow soldiers. And to the extent that we rely only on one of these facts, for example, that the naked soldier status as a member of a class that may be legitimately targeted, we have removed honor from the picture and we've transformed an ambiguous ethical question into one that is straightforwardly soluble by means of legal distinctions. 
So I refer us to Walter's famous example in order to point out that the naked soldier dilemma in which legality on the one hand and certain virtues such as honor or mercy on the other might in fact come into conflict. I point this out because that dilemma is no longer present to us in the context of 21st century high technology warfare. So never mind autonomous weapons or other AI applications, I think this dilemma has already been driven out of the picture with the much earlier advent of remote targeting platforms. Even those that require that a human be responsible for identifying and tracking the target and pulling the trigger. So terrorists and enemy combatants who are killed by drone strikes, for example, are typically naked, right? They don't wear uniforms. They don't fight on a specified battlefield. Uh, they pose no imminent threat to the drone operator and they can be killed while they're going about their daily unwarlike business, right? They're killed on the basis of their inferred or determined status as a member of a class of legitimate targets. And so Walter's point is that the facts of the naked soldier scenario so destabilize the distinction between those who constitute appropriate targets and those who do not, that the situation invites genuine ethical deliberation on the basis of the facts rather than a straightforward application of the rules of war. But the highly asymmetric and depersonalized nature of drone warfare does not and cannot account or you cannot account for and it cannot respond to such ambiguity or category confusion. And instead, what it does is obscure all relevant facts and focuses only on the distinction between legal and illegal targets. So what I want to say is that, you know, we're here today to discuss how AI systems can foster virtuous actions and thinking about whether that's possible. But I, I really think the question of how to allow for virtue in the context of algorithmic warfare is, um, to be honest, kind of a red herring. Uh, I think it's the wrong question for us to be asking here. Um, and that's because AI technology, and in fact, any technology that tends toward either removing the soldier from the particular context in which he must decide whether or not to kill, or a technology that limits the soldier's judgment to the application of predetermined rules, that kind of technology has already eliminated the possibility of virtue from the picture. And so the function of AI is to automate human processes by delineating a set, a set of possible decisions ahead of their actual application. But one cannot make a moral judgment in advance of its exercise. Moral judgment is not the kind of thing that can be pre-programmed in advance of particular applications. And so ethical action must involve both the assessment of whether a set of rules applies to a given situation, and it also involves how to apply those rules. But AI, what I want to say is that AI technology both erodes our understandings of the particulars of a given situation because it functions on the basis of aggregate data. And it also hollows out the soldier's potential for ethical agency because it codifies his possible responses in advance. And as such, it radically shrinks the bounds within which he can gauge in genuine deliberation. So to illustrate my point, in the remainder of my presentation, I want to consider a particular application of artificial intelligence. And this is pattern of life analysis and activity-based intelligence in the context of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency campaigns. So Walter's example is useful because you know, what it does is to show how the soldier shares the battlefield with his enemy in such a way that he may recognize the enemy as a vulnerable version of himself, right? He can experience a kind of respect for the enemy soldier who is taking a bath because of the implicit reciprocity of risk that comes from operating on the same battlefield, on the same plane. By contrast, I think if a drone operator locates an enemy target while the enemy is taking a bath, that same kind of recognition is much less possible because there is no battlefield, there's no shared vulnerability, and there's no reciprocity of risk. So the drone operator, therefore, is left only with the binary question of whether or not the target is a member of a class that may be legally killed. And activity-based intelligence, likewise, is a kind of attempt to translate context into binary code, right? It's an attempt to eliminate the need for human judgment, which is what context-specific action requires. So I'll turn now to my discussion of activity-based intelligence. 
So strategists of asymmetric warfare, you know, from Mao to Che Guevara have told us that the insurgents best strategy is to blend into the wider population, to use the population as a form of cover effectively. And so identifying insurgents who as a matter of strategy, look and act and live like their countrymen is this perpetual and fundamental challenge that has stymied American counterinsurgency since the Philippines campaign, when the US forces held civilians in concentration camps in an effort to isolate the enemy. But um, as former NGA director and future director of national intelligence, James Clapper said in 2004, everything and everybody has to be somewhere. So the collection of geospatial intelligence is central to the intelligence community's effort to track and identify suspicious behaviors within the area of operations that might represent a terrorist threat or another security concern. And so confronted with the profound difficulty of collecting reliable human intelligence sufficient to distinguish insurgents from civilians, and this is a problem that is compounded by this kind of inevitable slippage between the categories of insurgent and civilian that is always present to us in asymmetric contexts. American intelligence attempts to infer political identity from what can be easily collected. And this is geospatially referenced data that tracks the movements of populations within a specified area captured by remote surveillance platforms. So as battlefield awareness has expanded, so has the ability of the intelligence community to track typical and atypical movements of a given community across space and time. So activity-based intelligence responds to the question of how to distinguish between friend and enemy, not by asking who is who, but by asking rather who is where. And I think to substitute where for who or for why is to ask a technical question rather than a political question. And I wanna think through the implications of that. So rather than relying on human intelligence, which is considered by nature more difficult to collect and less reliable than electronic signals intelligence, remote imagery, measurement and signatures intelligence, the military has developed a kind of technological workaround to distinguish combatants from civilians. So geospatially referenced data from all these different kinds of sources combine to form a complex picture of the battle space in order to track trends and deviations over time across a particular geographic area. And so a vast network of remote sensors, satellite imagery, long endurance surveillance drones, et cetera, enables an analytic strategy to distinguish and locate um, suspicious behavior. And so ABI, activity-based intelligence, allows for a kind of predictive analysis of multi-source geospatial data to identify this behavior. So I wanna just quote here from um, a 2016 textbook on the principles of ABI. This is authored by former mission engineers at BAE Systems in Northrop Grumman. And they explain the intelligence or the origins of the intelligence strategy as follows. And so I'm just gonna read a, a block here for a second. So they write, the traditional intelligence cycle begins with the target in mind, but terrorists were usually indistinguishable from other people around them. The analysts, digital native savvy and visual analytic tools began by integrating already collected data in a geographic area. Often the only common metadata between two data sets was time and location. So they applied spatio-temporal analytic methods to develop trends and patterns from large diverse data sets. These data sets described activities, events and transactions conducted by entities, people or vehicles in that area. Sometimes the analysts would discover a series of unusual events that correlated across data sets. When integrated, it represented the pattern of life of an entity. The entity sometimes became a target. The subsequent collection and analysis of this entity, the resolution of identity and the anticipation of future activities based on pattern of life produced a new range of intelligence products that improved the effectiveness of the counterterrorism mission. So I think there's um, much actually to unpack in this account. For one, I'm interested in the detached description of the humans tracked by this technology as entities, which is a euphemism that in my view just underscores the incongruity of high technology warfare on the one hand and the language of virtue ethics on the other hand. Um, but what I'm most interested in here is the idea that geography should be taken as the organizing principle for multi-sourced intelligence. You know, the primacy of location is a central principle underlying ABI, and the textbook argues, quote, that since everything happens somewhere, all activities, events, entities, and relationships have an inherent spatial and temporal component, whether it is known a priori or not, end quote. 
And so the assumption of ABI is that the collection of reams of spatially and temporally referenced data will reveal a picture of a society's typical or habitual activities, events, movements, such that atypical or suspicious movements can be detected. So as Northrop Grumman's chief technologist explains, quote, in environments where there is no visual difference between friend and enemy, it is by their actions that enemies are visible. Motion is the first indication of activity. Temporal and visual patterns of change provide the context for intent, end quote. So in other words, while intent itself is not directly observable to intelligence analysts, it can be inferred from that which we can observe. And this is movements of individuals and populations across a geographical area captured by an expansive network of surveillance instruments. And so as the science and technology scholar Lucy Suchman has argued, she says the convenience of this proposition for technologies of data analytics should be obvious. So in other words, ABI conceptualizes inherently unobservable life worlds as observable patterns of movement across space and time, analyzable in terms of the categories innocent or suspect, and these categories have been decided in advance. And fittingly, these patterns are exactly what remote surveillance and sensing platforms are designed to observe, and they're exactly what algorithmic processes are equipped to sort and categorize. So in my mind, what's significant about this method of analysis is its transformation of a fundamentally political task, distinguishing between insurgents and civilians who have importantly distinct statuses under international law into a technical task premised upon the possibility of total surveillance. And so the assumption is that intent, right, uh, can be accurately inferred from the kinds of data militaries happen to be able to collect. And so expanding and refining the military surveillance regime is a far more feasible, practical, and straightforward than doing the political work of identifying who counts as an enemy or as a friend. But I'm also interested in pattern of life analysis and activity-based intelligence, because I think they help us to see exactly how target identification practices that rely on the collection and algorithmic processing of surveillance data have already eliminated this naked soldier problem from the picture. And again, I'm kind of using the naked soldier problem here as a shorthand for what it would mean to maintain a space of ethics on the battlefield. So we can describe two ways of seeing, I think. First of all, you can see like the activity-based intelligence analyst on the one hand, and on the other hand, you can see like a sniper on the ground, right? The sniper who comes across the naked soldier while he's taking a bath. So you have seeing like a total surveillance on the one hand and seeing like a sniper on the other hand. Um, and so I think, you know, the total surveillance is only and can only be interested in the distinction between illegal and illegal targets. Right, this distinction between two categories. Whereas the sniper, by contrast, is not only interested in applying that distinction, but he's also interested in the relation of that distinction to some other uncodified norm of human action, like honor or mercy. So for the total surveillance, it's a binary question of legal or illegal, accurate or inaccurate. But for the sniper on the ground, it's a much more expansive question of whether a particular human being like himself is worthy of mercy in a given context. You know, I, I think the problem entailed by activity-based intelligence is broader, is, 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 a, is, is actually a broader problem of highly asymmetric warfare. Total surveillance enabled by algorithmic data analysis is a technological solution designed to solve the problem of picking out enemies that can't easily be distinguished from a broader population. And on the one hand, this problem, which is, you know, that is the confusion of combatant and non-combatant, is particular to the kind of wars that are fought in the 20th century, right? Whereas by contrast, in the naked soldier example, the sniper actually doesn't have any confusion about his target's identity. He knows that the target is an enemy target. But on the other hand, total surveillance technology also waves away the naked soldier problem precisely because it has the capacity to track the enemy on and off the battlefield. And so it doesn't distinguish between an enemy combatant taking, taking a bath and an enemy combatant planting an IED. And so as a result, we are left only with a problem of binary identification. Is this individual a legal target or not? And there is no space in the algorithmic process in which military agents may recognize the target as both friend and enemy, as the sniper who sees the naked soldier does. Um, and that's because in the context of the sniper, there is a context of reciprocal risk on the battlefield. It's only because both actors are in analogous situations that the naked soldier problem shows up to the sniper at all. Nor is there space in the algorithmic process 
for military agents to refuse their military duty because they judge for themselves that the rule is inapplicable, not because the rule is inaccurate to the situation, but because in fact, the situation demands a response that stands outside the rules of combat altogether. So just to close, you know, Walter gives us several examples of snipers who declined to shoot the naked soldier. But presumably there are thousands of other examples in the sniper of, when the sniper of course did shoot the naked soldier in accordance with his military duty. And Walter's point is that both courses of action, killing and refusing to kill may be right or may be wrong, right? And there's something more objective and potentially even more just about algorithmic processes that allow us to produce a coordinated and legally consistent answer to the problem of who should be killed. And, and, and we'll make that problem true. We'll make the answer to that problem true in all possible cases. But I do think that the trade-off entailed by this coordinated and consistent response entails also the destruction for the space of genuine ethical judgment on the battlefield in which the correct course of action has not and cannot ever be laid out in advance. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, all of you. I will be uh, uh, moving on next as the discussant. But first, I would like to ask the audience, um, please, if you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A box because I got like pages full and not sure we want to torture uh, the discussants of all my questions. So please, please go ahead and submit them. So first, as a general comment, I really, really like how you all combined uh, theory with, with practice um, and combine, and especially as you looked at both historical and contemporary weapon systems, uh, showing how we, what we're talking about, about the ethics in AI, it's not some far sighted future problem what we're talking about is to now today uh, how are we going to using how are using the weapons today how are we building the weapons today um, I, I really really liked like that Hi highlighted how 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 yeah contemporary pro this problem sorry this problem already is um, since I only have ten minutes I will be uh, give a little bit brief feedback back. Uh, for all of you, I'll, I'll give one point to consider, uh, to incorporate in your work or to think about, and a question that we can address in the QA to, with all of you as well. So first, Colonel Cook. I, I must admit, I really liked your title. I love literary references in, um, in, 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 in academic papers. And I really, really liked also your, your, your use of like historical um, experiences, particularly because we see AI so often as something new and something different. And, and I really like how you highlighted like the continuity and the change that we have. One thing that you uh, perhaps might consider, and I say this well as a, as a non-American, I guess, and a US ally, is uh, the differences in ethical training. I don't know if you've read the book of Marcus Schultz, Schultzke, apologies for my pronunciation, on um, pursuing moral warfare. But it talks about how Israel, US and UK have different sorts of ethic training. It, it says that like the US army is very much yeah, virtue based. The UK is a combination of virtue and pragmatism. And then the Israeli army is very uh, rule based. Um, so considering that that some of the closest allies that we have might have sort of different ethical frameworks, how should we then um, yeah, approach ethics in warfare, uh, particularly if you feel something about the export of weapons to, to these allies, might that cause troubles? Might that cause troubles on the battlefield if we have different sorts of ethical frameworks that are not as much virtue-based? And as a question for you that I would love to hear more about is you, you mentioned the, the importance of, well, PR or selling weapons as a military. How, how do you see... Um, how has this developed since the 80s to now, the sort of PR that military has to do to sell its cyber and AI systems? I would love to hear more from that. Uh, Jonathan, also, I really loved your, your presentation and your paper. It's super interesting. Um, Jonathan has actually written more than he told you already. So I got uh, the luxury of reading more and it was really, really fascinating. I really liked your concept of cognitive atro atrophy. I, I thought that was really, really um, point po poignant. I can never pronounce the word. And also, what I really liked how you talked about we need, we need rules for identifying both functioning and non-functioning systems. That is so critical. Um, so to build upon that, what I think one uh, subject you might want to look into 
uh, is the whole debate about testing, validation, verification of military systems, and particularly the question of metrics. Because what's a huge problem in machine learning and AI in general is the lack of metrics. We don't know exactly how it is performing. And I'm not even talking about questions about opacity, transparency, but just even if you know, if you are a developer, we, we lack appropriate tools and techniques to to assess what can the system do? How is it built? What is an expected performance or not? And that makes it so hard as well to assess when is it failing or not? So this is something you might want to consider moving forward. And as a question for you, what really piqued my curiosity is to what extent you might have experienced difference in uh, soldier experience with hardware or more software uh, based systems. Obviously, everything is cyber physical, everything is combined. But I, I, I'm just curious if, if you had seen like, uh, yeah, soldiers or experiments or had heard about things, uh, because I can imagine we've all heard probably about the anthropomorphization of, of robots that soldiers are just all humans like experience and how also how well uh, experienced soldiers rely so much on okay this 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 sounds different uh, this smells different this vibrates different to assess failure and that seems so much more difficult in software based systems so have you read or heard anything about about these differences between hardware and software and again obviously it's all cyber physical but i would love to hear more uh, Anna, uh, if, if I may call you that way, also I really loved your paper. It was really great. Actually, gave me a lot of great new new ideas and insights. Um, it, it is uh, yeah, the revenge of geography 2.0. It was, was a great paper. Um, what what I um, particularly liked, and perhaps also um, um, uh, might also want to consider elaborating a little bit more on is or at least what what i was thinking about is the role of race or ethnicity religion like you touch upon it uh, like almost implicitly you talk about like uh observe like uh yeah danish shoulders observing people in afghanistan when they're following ramadan or not but it feels like particularly the combination of geography and observation that that that, that are, it feels that there, there's a role for discussing the role of, of race ethnicity which is particularly important topic it's always been important but now especially so to think about how how we can um think about that ethically and uh particularly and we all know the bias in, in ai um what i would maybe love for you to expand a little bit on as well is, is a concept that you talked about the difference between amoral and immoral like that you there's not an option to be moral or not or whether you can violate morals. I thought that was really interesting and I would love to hear more about that. And then as as the final point, just as an observation, when you talked about the naked shoulder, I just had to think about uh, Paul Chares, uh, uh, you know, example when he talked about people were approaching the robot in different different ways and how how would the robot have um, responded if a naked soldier had had approached them? Would have been totally different out of out of the rules that he'd been trained with? I don't know. I just that image had, had amused me all, all presentation long. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. I really really enjoyed all your papers and presentations, and it gave me a lot of great ideas. I've got some more questions if the audience doesn't have them. But first, let me turn over to you. Um, perhaps in in the order of uh, first. Um, of, 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 of appearance to, to hear your thoughts or respond to each other as well. First of all, uh, thank you very much for the generous reception. I, I very much appreciate your question and your point as well. Uh, it's interesting, I have never met um, Marcus Scholitzka, even though he's just up the road. He's, he's Denver-based is what I understand. Um, I've read a couple paragraphs of what he says. Certainly, there, there's a lot to it. There are very different moral frameworks. There's also a difference in the way that we choose the role models and the instructors. For example, um, I have spent a lot of time in Germany, and uh, it's interesting. My friends who teach ethics there tend to be on the side of the chaplaincy. That would be almost unthinkable in the United States because of our built-in constitutional tension between uh, non-establishment and free exercise, we tend to uh, secularize in a more profound way than many European countries. Um, I'll also say that your uh, point struck home, it brought to mind a very angry Dutchman 
who was a friend of mine, but I was the first American handy after the U.S., um, I'll call it the stealth resource, the B-2 had taken off from Whiteman Air Force Base, flown thousands and thousands of miles to Belgrade during the Kosovo campaign, and had horrifically attacked the Chinese embassy. Uh, there was a Guardian article shortly thereafter that suggested that that was not an intelligence failure after all. I've always considered that it probably was, but my friend from Holland was angry uh, about a kind of cultural uh, imperialism that he detected in his friends in the U.S. And that had to do with the amount of resources we could bring to bear. Uh, you may know that in the Combined Air Operations Center that ran the air war over Kosovo, there was uh, sophisticated software used. And of course, there were the stealth resources. And that was a potent combination, so potent that it was decided that there would be two air tasking orders. There were also security considerations, obviously. But our European coalition partners never saw the air tasking order, which is the main product that choreographs the air war um, coming from the uh, Combined Air Ops Center. And of course, my friend rightly pointed out, there was certainly a good point that he made that had we been more uh, eager to share and done the air tasking order for stealth resources as we did for all others that came out of the Combined Air Ops Center, we might have avoided bombing the Chinese embassy. And, and so I take that to be very much consistent with your good point. I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And, and one of the things I really appreciate about your, your conversation, Colonel Cook, and that I think we need to reckon with more is that um, a lot of these developments in AI, we, 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 you know, there's this massive civilian breakthrough in AI in the 2010s, which by the way, was in many ways was underwritten uh, not only by changing Silicon Valley, but also by the military's needs in Iraq and Afghanistan. But actually from within the military, the challenges that we hope AI responds to are actually a little older. And they go back to this like quantum increasing complexity with complex weapon systems and therefore complex maintenance set schedules, complex training, complex layering of battlefield effects that, you know, I think already by the 70s and 80s, we're beginning to outrun what humans can do alone. And we're already, as you mentioned, you know, even in Vietnam, we're already actually leaning on kind of algorithmic rules-based good old fashioned AI systems for managing air traffic, for example. Um, so I think there's a really good historical perspective that I found really helpful and I, I want to learn more about. Um, to your question, Mike, uh, about hardware versus software, I think this is so essential. And another really important distinction that often gets missed, um, you know, because there are all kinds of hardware, including like quite advanced hardware, uh, kind of like complex hardware, quite high tech hardware that nonetheless permit this kind of basic human phenomenological access to underlying reality. And, the, and therefore, most importantly, the formation of intuitions about what is going on in reality. And I think, you know, I do think you can develop skilled intuitions about software systems, but it is a different order. It's a different set of skills. It requires different engagement and history with them. And one challenge we face is that, at least in personal experience, right, we tend to develop those intuitions based on really on, on, on lots of skillful practice with a transparent system, right? So, you know, if you're a coder, if you're working on like a net, like network ops or whatever, then you're gonna in, you're, you're in the bowels of the system and that's when you can begin to develop intuitions about it, right? But a lot of the ways which we're actually using software in the military are UX layer, we're building UX layers that we hope that not that, like, not that skilled service members can use to access a, 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 in a complex, uh, capacity without having a full understanding of the inner mechanics of that system, right? And in that situation, you can't develop intuition about what's really going on underneath the hood. Now, a lot of those, a lot of those limitations are, don't have anything to do with AI, but if you add AI on top of it, when you're getting an, you're getting an AI output, which you already have difficulty understanding because of the complexities of machine learning, on top of an overall like cyber technical system that you is also hidden from you then I think your ability to develop intuitions of whether it's working or not is basically zero, right? So I think a good example is we all kind of know intuitively is like your iPhone, right? Your iPhone is designed to be maximally easy to use and 
at the same time, maximally opaque to you. And if something has gone wrong with like the software in your iPhone, there's basically nothing you can do except try to restart it, try to re, you know, reboot it, try to reinstall an update. You can do these kind of big things to, to fix it, but you can't solve the problem because it's just so removed from you. Um, and so as the military thinks about developing AI, one of, there is this trade-off between what you, getting into soldiers' hands and letting, letting them use it or service members' hands, get in, letting them use it tomorrow versus actually what do we need to do? What rungs do we need to put in the ladder of skills development to allow them to develop intuitions about edge cases? And I think the kind of, I'll conclude with this, you know, in um, uh, Anti-Fragile, um, Nicholas Nassim Taleb uh, points out a characteristic of so-called um, fat tail cases, which I think is really badly understood. Fat tail, so, so um, events that are highly improbable, but occur more frequently than in a normal bell curve distribution, those fat tail occurs are characterized not by fewer, but by more cases within the norm. It's kind of a counterintuitive conclusion, but it's actually when you have a very narrow band of performance that almost by definition, because of its narrowness, uh, those outliers are, are, you get more and bigger outliers more commonly than if you had a wider band of performance, right? So in other, in other words, to this specific situation, you know, it's almost the situations where the software works really well 95% of the time that those 5% are going to be far more baffling to soldiers. If you had software that performed along a kind of margin of, you know, half, half the time works okay, you know, two, the other, you know, 25%, it works marginally, you got to fix it, then 25% is really off the rails. Then you're actually exposing soldiers to a wide variety of situations and they're actually beginning to form intuitions about it. So in some ways, it's these, these, these systems which are going to work really well almost all the time, they're going to have the most catastrophic outcomes in that small number of cases where they don't work. And again, I mentioned it in my, my talk, but I think the USS Fitzgerald case and the collision there, which killed 13 sailors, I believe, is a really good example of this problem, where relying on systems that are actually very high uptime, very high reliability, but can still fail, it actually will get you in more trouble in some ways. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your comments and your questions, Micah. These are very, very helpful and interesting. Um, just, to, just to respond to something you said, um, and then I, I just want to respond to a couple of things that came up in, um, in uh, my colleagues' presentations. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested in the distinction between um, amorality and immorality and what it means for moral questions to be entirely taken off the table such that a decision maker isn't necessarily making an immoral decision. Though, of course, I think it is, is definitely possible for an immoral rule or an immoral law to be programmed into an artificial intelligence program. Um, but it seems to me that, that the bigger threat is that um, ethical decision making or ethical deliberation is basically just taken off the table altogether. And I, I guess I'm interested in thinking about that because it seems to me that um, in this discussion, it would be worthwhile to distinguish between ethical judgment on the one hand and what we might call practical judgment on the other hand. And you know, practical you know, practical judgment maybe um, is something like tacit knowledge. And I think it um, gets to many of the issues that John has been discussing, right? Um, the need for um, a kind of intimacy or um, intimate knowledge of the machine itself so that in the case of systems failure or systems malfunction um, or something like that, the human in the loop um, is able to read the context and able to read the situation, you know, to understand that the machine isn't operating correctly in a, you know, given the particulars of a, of a certain context. And this seems to me to be an extremely important part of um, thinking about what it would mean to keep humans in the loop in a meaningful and effective way um, in the context of algorithmic systems. Um, but I guess I'm interested in, 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 in clearly specifying um, what the difference is between that kind of um, tacit knowledge or practical judgment on the one hand and um, grappling with ethical questions or engaging with ethical deliberation on the other hand. And I recognize, of course, that especially when it comes to virtue ethics, you know, ethical deliberation and practical judgment are very much combined, right? Um, you know, the, what's different about virtue ethics as compared to a deontological or a consequentialist framework is that it deals with a particular case and doesn't merely um, mechanically apply certain kinds of rules. And so practical wisdom is very much involved in that. Um, but 
but I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm, I worry a little bit that, um, in, that focusing on judgments that ultimately um, do not uh, investigate or interrogate uh, the military, uh, the particular um, mission or goal of any, any given um, operation, that to me seems like a judgment that is different in kind from an ethical judgment, you know, in the context of the naked soldier, the sniper has actually decided to disregard the military's um, particular mission in, in that specific moment, which would be, of course, his duty would be to kill the enemy soldier. And it seems to me that something that's distinctive about ethical deliberation is it allows for that possibility, right? It allows for the possibility of um, refusing or disregarding uh, the goal or the, the agenda that um, has already been put into place. And it's helpful to make that distinction. Um, I think also, you know, I wanted to just follow up on something that Colonel Cook said a little bit earlier. Um, I, I believe Colonel Cook said that, you know, um, there are some, some folks in the kind of AI and ethics space who are interested in, um, in developing algorithmic approaches that are more consistent with deontic or utilitarian models. And that seems to me to be um, kind of an interesting non-solution to the problem because, you um, it seems, you know, deontic and, and, and consequentialist models are rule-bound models, right? Or they're models that um, are consistent with the operation of an algorithmic process, right? And my worry there is that if that is the solution, that means that we're basically squeezing the ethics to fit into the demands of the machine, right? And so if, you know, for those who are arguing that we should follow a deontic or consequentialist model, it's very important to justify exactly why that model is the appropriate model in the context of warfare, rather than the context context of algorithmic warfare particularly, because if we do so only in the context of algorithmic warfare, we have already conceded way too much to the machine, in my view. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to move over to a couple of audience questions now. Uh, first, we have the question of Carl Smith. Um, he asks or, or, uh, about how we address the inherent bias of uh, weird, so to say, is a, a big problem in, in a lot of contemporary research and a lot of the people that we study are Western, educated, industrialized, rich and, and democratic. So they're not rep representative for the entire country, let alone all the um, yeah experiences that we will encounter in warfare. And uh, he also points out um, that uh, a comparative methodology might help move past the parochialism or elitism of Western virtue ethics. Um, I, I think this actually touches upon things that you've all said because Colonel Cook, you talked about the elitism in, and whether, well, elitism or whether that was a, be, a, a bad word these days or not. Um, similar, uh, Jonathan, you do a lot of work on like the practical design of how can we build these systems. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm also interested in, in hearing yeah, your, your thought about yeah, different potential value systems here. So I, I would love to hear your, your take on, on this question. Maybe we can start now in the reverse order, I start with, with Anna. Sure, I mean, I think, um, I think that this question gets to um, a point about AI systems that you know is certainly not my original point and has been made many times before. But this is the concern that the data that is um, uh, uh, both the data and the decision-making processes that are that are programmed into the AI systems, um, you know, are not neutral, right? They are not free of cultural bias, right? And um, a machine learning is only able to do as well as the kind of data that it learns from. And if that data reflects the weirdness of um, Western society, then that is exactly how it's going to learn. And that may not be applicable to context or situations um, involved in overseas war. Um, and so I certainly think that this is a significant problem and it's an important problem to keep at the forefront of our minds because um, you know, it's certainly the case, again, this is, a, this is um, not a new point that I'm making at all, but um, I think users of AI you know, are easily illusioned um, or, or uh, sort of easily taken by the idea that the AI system um, is neutral or objective, or in fact, you know, um, uh, 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 much less biased than a human user. Um, 
I think in a comparative methodology uh, in terms of um, comparing AI systems used by different governments or in different cultural context, contexts that are actually feeding different data into the system uh, could potentially be really useful. Um, what it might do is uh, help actually to sort of flag how um, biased or how skewed the data the, the data processing systems actually are. I don't know that it would help us to create a sort of more objective data set or that it would help us sort of like cancel out the biases across data sets. But I do think what it would do is sort of flag that issue for us. And that's an important issue, you know, to keep uh, uh, very much present. Yeah, um, I think I'd highlight two things. The first is that you know, one benefit I think one benefit I think of virtual ethics approach is we're less, we're a little. You know, I, there is something almost imperialistic about thinking that you could embed a universal ethics in an AI system, right? That's like that is a very weird, you know, in your sense, in the sort of you know Western educated and industrial rich democratic idea. That, oh yeah, we have we we actually have access to a perfect ethics, and we're going to program our computer. And now we'll have a perfect Kantian robot that will behave ethically any way we want. So that even that aspiration is kind of weird. And virtual ethics begins by abandoning that, right? So all ethics is going to be embedded in an actual society, in actual institutions, which will have unique characteristics. Um, the problem, a deeper problem, and this goes to Anna's excellent point, is to what extent are what we pay attention to and our assumptions about the world, what, to what extent do they get buried within these systems. And that's, it. again, if our concern is exercising military judgment, that's an area where a really well-trained you know, service member practitioner might be able to do it by themselves, but, it, but then actually is restrained by the system. So again, you know, I, I think I know the most about how this looked like in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, Iraq and Afghanistan, you have these tactical military intelligence soldiers, you know, some of them are senior are NCOs or you know, enlisted, some of them are, are senior officers or field grade officers, they're running fusion centers in small Iraq, you know, towns and cities in Iraq, right? And they don't have, a, they don't have enough training, but they have some training and they're there and they're, they're, they're trying to encounter the world. They're meeting with local, you know, stakeholders. Um, they're trying to learn, they're trying to get at it, right? Um, and one of the things that they allowed them to do is they, they were able to recognize failures in systems. So one of the failures that they became very cognizant of that was very challenging was, um, you know, Arabic, you know, Arabic and English aren't the same language. When you translate, there are a number of ways you can transliterate the same Arabic word or words into English. And so one problem they kept having to have had, and which was very labor intensive was actually figuring out who tracking the same people through their various intelligence systems when their name had been transliterated or written in different ways, right? Um, how does this relate to the question of weirdness? Well, we can bury assumptions about the world into our data structures, right? We can bury assumptions about real, what religiosity means and therefore who is very religious and therefore who might be susceptible to uh, radical Islam, uh, ideal, radical Islamic ideology or ideas about the connection between radical Islamic ideology and you know, being opposed to the American political project, right? We can bury those ideas in our data sets. And I'm reminded of the Borges, uh, an essay where Borges um, uh, refers to a, Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge, a kind of supposed like uh, uh, classical Chinese encyclopedia, which just looks at the world with a radically different set of categories than, your, than he contrasted to a kind of 20th century French project to classify the world, right? And so because we're building these systems within our culture, within our processes, where we can embed our assumptions about the world at the level of data, and I think if, if you're looking at the world through the lens of that system, then all of those kind of phenomenological firsthand experiential tools you have to get past your own cultural biases are kind of eroded or hampered. And that would be one of my concerns. Well, thanks for the, uh, the good question. I think that I'm probably not saying anything new in the following, but perhaps I'm rewording it. Uh, I believe that virtue ethics has its roots in a particular context that's inevitable, I think, with any ethical system, and that it was indeed an elitist ethical system of labor to label certain people barbarians, uh, for example. 
And th there is an ace in the hole, however, and that is that we can take, for example, cardinal virtues, let's just think about justice and reinterpret that word in a way that many of the people, the contemporaries in the elite society that would have bought into virtue ethics, let's say, in the fifth and fourth centuries BC, would probably not countenance, but we might have good reasons for doing so. The analogy would be, for example, that we have founders who have created some wonderful ringing documents on the backs of, for example, a system of slavery in our own United States and have been elitist enough in their own right to create things like the Electoral College to make sure that uh, hoi polloi don't uh, have too great and direct a say in who represents in our legislature, just for example, or in the executive branch. We're able to have a discussion about those flaws, as many would call them, those weirdnesses in our own system within our own context. So I think the question that Kyle poses is exactly um, proper. I think it, however, doesn't necessarily sink once and for all a virtue ethics approach so long as we can reinterpret what it means to be excellent, what it means to to have virtue. And, and that's important that we do it. I'll just circle real quickly back to uh, Anna's point about expert, expert systems agree 100%. Uh, I, I think it's weird too, as do many of the early proponents of those systems. I can recall a time way back again in the dark ages when I got to hear Ed Fagenbaum, who was then uh, AI God, still is in some ways, he was at Stanford at the time. And he was really excited about expert systems in medicine. But he hasten to add, and I think everybody in the audience, if you could have seen the cartoon thought bubble was thinking, yeah, but boy, you're building an awful lot of baggage into those systems. For example, about who gets to live and who gets to die, who gets to have care, who doesn't, who will get scarce resources and who won't, and that's inevitable. So uh, those are things that should make us all cringe and I'm cringing right along with you. One final point, I appreciate everybody calling me Colonel Cook, but that's uh, a false authority that I don't deserve in this uh, uh, August panel or audience. So I, I just go by Jim, I don't know how I came out as Colonel James Cook on the little thing, but whoever whoever did that, thank you very much. It, uh, as I say, the, the shoe doesn't fit in this context. So Jim is more than enough. Thanks. I, I then I have um, two well, questions for for specific uh, people. Uh, first, uh, Anna, you a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, uh, they ask that. Um, AI-enabled weaponry often leads to less face-to-face -face interaction between combatants. Uh, for instance, they might launch a missile rather than have boots on the ground. And what is the ethical line there? And to build upon that, you touched upon it very briefly, but maybe you can expand on it as well. To what extent is taking a risk necessary to be virtuous in, in war, uh, like the need to be face-to-face? -face. And to what extent... Can we even talk about some sort of symmetrical level risk in, in contemporary warfare, even without AI and, and remote systems? And for Jonathan, I've got a question. Uh, Brian Williams asked, uh, have you looked at the use of assurance cases with arguments and evidence to approach uh, yeah, the question of assessing confidence in the capability of, of, of weapon systems? Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, I mean, I um, I guess I'm not sure exactly what's meant by what is the ethical line, but um, I, I certainly think that it makes an enormous ethical difference once soldiers are removed from the battlefield. Um, and for the reasons that I explained, I mean, I think um, Walter's point is to say that um, an ethical decision about a treatment of another human being involves recognizing um, uh, you know, the, the person you are encountering as a fellow human being. And that's not to say that that's impossible to do in the context of remote warfare. Um, there have actually been a number of studies showing that um, drone operators face similar risks, I believe, of, P of uh, PTSD as um, soldiers who have been deployed on the ground. And there's a way in which the um, like high definition video that a, that a drone operator is able to access um, that actually makes them, you know, uh, feel as though they have um, a closer look at the action that is happening on the ground um, than, than soldiers who may be on the same battlefield, but at some distance away or caught up in the chaos and the fog of war and who may not actually get that, that very close look. So I, I certainly don't mean to suggest that um, 
drone operators are necessarily um, living as though they're playing video games and have no access to, um, you know, the, the human emotion that that someone like Walter is describing. But um, but I think like the important point about Walter's scenario is that it is only the context of reciprocal risk that um, allows the, the sniper to, to, to look at the nature naked soldier and say, here is someone who, even though he occupies enemy status, um, is someone who uh, also at the same time is both a soldier and not a soldier, right? He's someone who, you know, at, at, at certain moments sort of steps into the role of soldier. That's, of course, not how the law treats that soldier. Once a soldier, you are a soldier regardless of, I mean, there are, of course, um, certain exceptions, for example, if you're in a, in a hospital, for instance. But, um, uh, you know, the fact that you are taking a bath or smoking a cigarette or whatever doesn't really make a difference. Um, but I think Walter's point is to say that it's only those who have a kind of shared experience of the battlefield um, who are able to see that um, their opponent, you know, kind of steps in and out of the role of soldier and as such can see them as friend and enemy at the same time. I think that's not something that seems to me to be less possible from a distance, even if from a distance you see the soldier, the naked soldier taking a bath or smoking a cigarette or whatever. Um, I, I mean, I think the other sort of important point here is about context. And it seems to me that um, AI systems or remotely piloted surveillance systems um, are probably not able to always see. Well, I mean, this is a tricky thing, right? Uh, the, in context, when you're when you're in a particular context, you need to um, kind of get a sense of all of the relevant information and all of the relevant variables that are in play in that given context. And this is difficult to do both for the AI system, and it's also difficult to do, of course, for the human being. And I'm sure there's an argument that AI systems are meant are much much more observant and perceptive, and um, you know don't have the same kind of blinders that humans do, and um, you know can pick up on pick up and classify and make meaning out of even more information in a particular context than a human can. But um, when it comes to ethical decision-making, the question is, well, what information is important, right? It's not just sort of adding up all of the different variables. The question is, which variable really matters in this case? Which variable, you know, is it his status as an enemy combatant? Or is it the fact that he's not posing an imminent threat? Or is it the fact that he's smoking a cigarette or whatever it is, right? That's the important piece of information that informs your ethical decision. And I don't think that um, the algorithm has a way of, of weighing those different factors, or it only has, if, if, it, if it can, it's, it's only because it's been programmed to do so in advance. It, you know, it's weighing those different factors is not an ethical activity. Um, you know, it's an activity that is designed to um, fulfill and produce certain military outcomes that have already been decided. And so I don't think that um, in that case, an algorithm is actually capable of making an ethical decision or weighing um, different variables in a way that we should describe as meaningfully ethical or moral or virtuous. Um, is taking a risk necessary for virtuous action? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, that's a very good question. And I am inclined to say that, um, I'm inclined to say that it does in the sense that, um, in the sense that when you uh, are weighing these different pieces of information, your relative risk is part of that overall picture, right? And, um, and of course, when the sniper sees the naked soldier, there is a, a kind of risk there, not just his sort of generic risk on the battlefield and the recognition of a shared experience of risk, but there's also the point that, you know, the naked soldier could have a rifle behind a rock or a bush or something like that and spot the sniper and pick it up immediately, right? And of course, it's the case that the naked soldier will ultimately pose a risk, um, you know, 10 minutes later when he puts on his uniform and joins the front lines. Um, and so uh, I think it certainly makes it um, a more difficult ethical decision, a more difficult, um, there, there's sort of like a, a higher threshold that needs to be met to behave honorably in that context. I don't know that that means that it's impossible to behave honorably in a different context. I mean, perhaps um, uh, identifying a principle by which um, a military uh, goal or a military objective should, or a military duty should be disregarded or discarded in favor of a different kind of principle is enough. Um, but I certainly think that um, the presence of risk uh, 
signals to us that there is um, a kind of calculation going on that um, is likely to be um, that is likely to be different in kind in some way than the kind of um, calculation that an AI system, which is never at risk, can make. So um, uh, I'll take Brian, I'll actually also respond to the second question as well briefly. So uh, I'm not, not exactly sure uh, what is meant by insurance cases. My understanding would be the ways in which you can test the parameters of actual system beho uh, behavior of uh, a software system, including an AI system by running to different scenarios to, to assess what it's going to do under different performance under different um, scenarios. And I actually, this is actually a good example to dive a little bit into the nitty gritty for a second of the problem with the gap between what I think I understand the ethical problems that AI poses to be and the military's own development processes. So assurance cases are a standard part of, of military software development, both on the kind of security side, but also in terms of battlefield performance. So if we're going to field a, um, a technology with an automated capacity, we're going to, as part of the safety confirmation testing, they're going to actually run it through the specs, right? You know, what percentage of the time does it pick up a, a visual classification target that it should pick up, right? Uh, you know, can it distinguish between target A and target B? Oh, that's all going to be part of it, right? But it's going to be done in a basically laboratory environment. Um, and then there will be a field, there will be fielding. Um, but what's interesting, right, is that the, um, my understanding would be that the actual kind of uh, native use of, of, of service members of the te technology is part of the field testing, but not part of the safety testing. In other words, that the system will already have been approved for fielding, and this is just part of kind of working out. The assumption is that the actual like training people to use this is one of the kinks to be worked out once it's already almost ready to go. Um, and so that's a different, you know, I think if you flip this in the head and you ask that what's the effect of this new technology on humans, then I think a different set of concerns come up. So for example, um, the problem would not necessarily be if you, if you look at like using AI to generate simulation environments and scenarios, the problem isn't, is it gonna do something weird? It's, you know, these new scenarios, which might be scenarios humans would never think of, what are they gonna do to the service members who are responding to them and developing intuitions about battle, the battlefield on the basis of these scenarios? Um, so I think that, that in addition to and a kind of analogy to software might be assurance cases will tell you about the security performance of software. It won't help you solve human social engineering problems, which by the way, are the vast majority of cases of actual like hacking. So um, I think you need both. I think you need to know the parameters of the system, but also we need to know the parameters of the humans who are gonna be using the system. Um, the second question about the development of use of AI for selection and recruiting, I think this is huge. This is one of the biggest applications of AI that no one's really talking about. Briefly, and I guess I know the army the best, there's almost kind of like two, um, there's like three ways the army does selection. There's basic standards, like if you pass the standards, you're in. If you go to boot camp and you pass the standards, you're and you know, and you know, you, you're minimum viable, like at a physical and mental health, you're in, right? And then there's a certain level of like higher, uh, higher standard gradations where you have to, uh, you know, you have to pass a certain number of tests and skills uh, to reach, uh, you know, to become get an MOS. And then there's a different world of actual like intensive selection where we're actually gonna select for, and, and basically those first, first two are done with standardized tests of one kind or another. We're gonna test everybody on an ASVAB. We're gonna test everybody with this basic skill. And if you pass a certain score, you're in, right? Then there's a whole selective world of actual kind of selection and assessment, mostly for special operations these days and some things like piloting, we're actually, we're gonna test intangibles, we're gonna test character, we're gonna test skills, we're gonna test interactions, we're gonna put you through a number of real world trials, get an assessment of your personality and fit it to a particular mission, right? And that's a very resource intensive approach. It's very effective, but it's very resource intensive. And so one of the promises of AI, I think, is can we bring a little bit more judgment uh, of actual um, of aptitude at an industrial, can we scale up the judgment of aptitude? and personality and fitness between individuals and mission sets. Um, and that, that could be a way to really improve selection uh, in the military, improve military performance uh, in a way that isn't possible in the kind of current industrial scale uh, method. So I think, that, I think that's a really important use case that people aren't really thinking about yet. Awesome. I, uh, it's, it's a thanks for uh, just grabbing that question. Jonathan, I was heading to it next. So thanks for already 
uh, addressing it. And I have a, a question for the three of you. You're welcome to respond if you have something, um, if you have uh, specific thoughts about that. But Ron Kiesing brought up that, uh, well, one of the important themes that we've been talking about today is how, what are the opportunities to develop yeah, uh, weapon systems with AI that that we both that allows both for the users to develop intuition or tested knowledge or a feeling about how it works uh, at the same time that it can incorporate like the human experiences, uh, especially uh, Jonathan, like your work on um, how humans in practice actually behave with these systems is often Far, quite different than one has been envisioned by the designers. So these, these human experiences with these new systems, uh, how can we then best then take that back and incorporate that into development? Um, and I guess then my question to build upon that is, is there perhaps a role for a mixture of some old fashioned expert systems with practical wisdom of uh, of practitioners combined with well, uh, good uh, modern AI machine learning techniques. Is is there a role for these mixed systems that we can better incorporate human experiences or the tested knowledge? I really love that you brought this up, uh, Anna, in the context of well, meaningful human judgment. I really think that that's such a um, yeah, smart insight. It's it, tested knowledge is a very big theme in in the science technology studies literature, but it, it's I love the connections that you that you made here. Um, uh, so I, I would love to hear your thoughts here. Uh, how what like particularly a bit solution oriented thinking about move how to move forward that we can incorporate the human experiences with the web assistant with AI, but also ensure that we build systems in a way that allows the users to develop trust, intuition, test knowledge, experience in a safe, ethical way. And uh, you look very confused. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to take a first stab at this, Len, Anna, and Jim. Uh, so your honest question specifically is, you know, what are the opportunities to capture practical wisdom from human users through measured introduction AI-enabled capabilities and improve systems over time through experience? It's a really okay. important question. Maybe oh, let sorry. me cl clarify very quickly. What I'm particularly interested in hearing perhaps some solution-oriented ideas about how to move forward building these systems in a safe, ethical yes. way that incorporates human experiences, ensures the development of trust, but uh, yeah, like in an ethical, virtuous way, as we've been talking about, um, if, that, if that, that's more clear. No, yeah, that's right. It's a really interesting question. And I'm thinking about my all my my time talking to soldiers, interviewing soldiers, like and many of them are, are I mean, the most interesting people I'll talk to about this are NCOs. And if I had one plug for like the converse, the military AI policy conversation versus reality is if you want to think about ethical behavior in reality, you have to talk to NCOs. These are the guys who are going to be actually conducting and overseeing the people who are conducting these systems in the field in most cases, at least for ground combat operations. Um, and as to go to something Anna said, so much of, of how of their tacit knowledge is embedded in, in, in intuitions, which they themselves don't fully understand, or in highly, highly contextualized judgments about particular situation. So, you know, if you take one of these like gristled, you know, army soft NCOs out in the field and you ask like, hey, where, where would be a good place for an ambush? We have this route coming along. Where would be, where would be a good place for an ambush or where would you expect the enemy to lay an ambush, right? Their assessment is gonna be so molded by experience, so molded by the particularities of placement and where the trees are and soil type and position of the sun and how, you know, how uh, wet is the ground and all these things where, you know, I don't know how you would, but it's also specific that I don't know how you would, you couldn't just feed it in as a data point into the AI. The AI's approach to that problem, you might be, you might be able to develop a useful AI tool that could do something similar, but its approach would be very different, right? It would run tens of millions of scenarios using a set of like agent-based parameters to derive kind of from a kind of God's eye view, the same thing, a similar thing to what the NCO has developed through, through intuition. Um, where I think you might find it practically is in, is in bringing experts together with AI developers, AI development teams, 
and helping them get a sense rather than, because I think the one problem I see in ML research is we often take a kind of feature driven approach where we have all these features uh, that we're able to measure and we, we find the ones that lead to the best model performance and we just kind of pick those features, right? And I do wonder whether pairing developers in the field with experts might allow them to see the world through experts' eyes in ways which allow them to choose features which might not be intuitive, but might actually result in better model performance over time. So that'd be one idea. I think you can, I think the way you get task knowledge into these systems is at the level of human teams. I don't think it's just at a matter of, uh, I don't just, I don't think it's just through data collection. Uh, Mary Quinn also brought up that the well the question of integrating ethics and technology design is another uh, panel later today so stay tuned for that panel and also if, if you don't necessarily have any specific ideas um, then then I have another question for you but unless you you would like to answer this question no I mean I, I just add oh sorry go ahead oh, Jim, please, please. please no 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 uh, please please I've, I've I've talked a fair amount already please go ahead I will keep it very short then. Uh, this is kind of an obvious one, but it's one that matters a lot in the public sphere right now, especially with the apportionment of money. And that is that uh, many experts will tell you that we need more time than we have to come up to speed uh, and find parity with some of the adversary systems that we face. And so one of the ways that we blow it ethically is by running ourselves out of time. And it's, it's very difficult to convince people who uh, perhaps haven't been in the field, perhaps they're not that crusty, soft NCO, or perhaps he's the hardest guy to convince, or she is. But uh, one of the things we find over and over again is that we make ethical mistakes in our design of any kind of system, not just an AI system, when we run ourselves out of time. So um, in the public debate right now, uh, we're still, I believe, underfunding uh, AI research. And uh, to some, that might be a really good thing. They think, hooray, then we won't have these brutal nihilistic systems taking lives uh, for no good reason. We're going to have naked soldiers slaughtered in the bathtub, not just Osama bin Laden or something like that, slaughtered in his pajamas, right? So um, there, there are differing understandings, differing uh, senses of what we should be spending our money and time on. I think right now, the best thing we can do for ethical AI, AI systems is fund it and get out ahead of it to the extent that we can. It's kind of an obvious point, but perhaps it's worth saying. Did you want to add something, Anna? Um, I, I don't have much to add. I mean, in a way, you know, my position here is actually in a certain way, not a very solution oriented position. I have to say it's a critically oriented position. And I guess the, the warning that I'm concerned about both when it comes to tacit knowledge and to thinking about how to design these systems ethically is, um, I mean, when it comes to tacit knowledge, tacit knowledge is all about practice, right? And I'm not sure how to build tacit knowledge into a system, but something that we have to sort of be aware of is that, um, uh, as, as soon as the system starts taking on certain kinds of tasks, that you know means that um, humans are likely not to get practice in those tasks anymore. It'll just be too inefficient for them to spend their time doing that, right? And so, you know, at, already then we will have seen a shift from the kind of tacit knowledge that humans can actually practice and learn, and you know can't just learn once, but have to continually do potentially over you know an entire career or, or an entire lifetime. As soon as that, sh at that as that as those tasks are shifted it over to the AI system, you know, I, I don't know that we can really call it tacit knowledge anymore. I'm not sure that that category actually even applies to the technology because the technology is not, I mean, I don't think we can call machine learning a practice. I mean, I understand that um, AI systems learn from the data that they are presented with, um, but I don't think that uh, they develop kind of like you know, back of the envelope intuitions uh, in the same way. I mean, I don't think that that is the correct language to describe what an AI system does. So maybe this is a kind of um, linguistic or, uh, you know, semantic point more than anything else, but it's important to me at least to be very, very clear about our categories here. And whatever it is that the AI system is doing um, is not a practice that is equivalent or comparable to the kind of practice that a human being can be engaged with. And, you know, in a similar way, um, uh, 
you know, again, I'm, I'm not offering a very solution oriented perspective here, but I can offer a kind of warning, which is to say, um, I think, as I said before, we need to be very careful about distinguishing between ethical decision making and practical decision making or a kind of, um, you know, ethical orientation versus um, some kind of practical wisdom uh, or, or something like that. Um, again, an important category distinction. And um, and I, I want to keep those things really clear because, um, you know, I think it's the case that we can fall into the position of, of a feeling like ethics means checking certain kinds of boxes, right? Like this particular thing has been programmed, the principle of proportionality and distinction, you know, the AI system has mastered that. So like ethics is done, we're done with ethics, right? And I think that's the wrong way, of course, to think about it, right? Um, ethics is not something that is accomplished or that, you um, you know, can be uh, uh, achieved after a given period of time. It's a kind of ongoing um, dilemma that people face in particular situations, right? Not, it's not something that you can you can deal with in the general. You can deal with it only in the particular, and it's always going to come up to you anew. Um, and so, I guess you know, my 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 warning about. Um, uh, you know, thinking through these solutions is that it's very important to be clear about the categories that we're using and that those categories do not seamlessly translate from human experience to machine experience. And maybe we want to be very careful about thinking about, you know, for example, how the category of practice or tacit knowledge in the human realm, you know, to what extent can we seamlessly just move that into our thinking about the, the machine realm? You know, how are, how are we careful um, not to personify the machines or anthropomorphize the machines in a way that would actually be very distorting from um, both an ethical and a practical perspective? Thanks so much. Uh, I, we're unfortunately we've uh, run out of time, so I will uh, round it up here. Uh, I would just like, as one uh, to say, like as one closing remark here, as a complete non-philosopher, I've lately become interested in um, in stoicism, and you know, and that makes me think: to what extent can we use stoicism here in future ethics for AI? You know, like stoicism, if if we uh, sum that up as Grab me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. If that's what we could train AI to do, to know when it can actually make a difference and it's actually useful to know to use or not, uh, that would that would get us uh, that would get us ahead. Um, but uh, let me uh, turn the floor over to Paul Schurz. And thank you so much, Anna, Jim, and Jonathan for your for your amazing presentations. Yes, thank you so much. This was a wonderful session, like a lot of informative, insightful kind of thoughts coming from a lot of different perspectives, which was, was which was incredible. Uh, and I especially like uh, ending on the note of stoicism, which is my preferred version of virtue ethics. So that is great. Um, so we're going to take a lunch break right now, and we'll reconvene at 1.30 for Nigel Bigger's uh, keynote address. So thank you very much.